just happened to work out that way. All right. Well, good morning. Looking forward to worshiping together with y'all. Uh, let's pray. Father, thanks so much for this time that we can uh, just pause and acknowledge you to lift our eyes up to the hills, Lord. That's where our help comes from. Our help comes from you, the, the maker of heaven and earth. And you are, you're not going to faint. You're not going to grow weary. Uh, you are our ever-present help in time of need. And we just draw near to you this morning with hearts full of faith. We, we draw near with confidence knowing that we come to the throne of grace, that we might find help in our time of need. And so may you just meet with us, Father. That's our prayer, that uh, your people would just be strengthened in your presence. And that as we just lift our voices, it would be a, a pleasing uh, aroma to you, Lord, like incense rising up to heaven. So move among us, we pray. Have your way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
of the dead of love, of the dead of love that is gone, of the dead of love, of the dead of love that is gone, by this thankful heart. My 
my debt is paid because of your blood my sins are washed away now all of my life I freely give because of your love because of your because of your love that we're here this morning. It's because of your love that we have a song to sing. And uh, Lord, you filled our hearts to overflow by the power of the Spirit, Lord. You, you fill our hearts and reveal to us the, the width, the length, the depth, the height of your love, the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge. And just we find that indeed in your presence, there's that fullness of joy. There's pleasure forevermore just in knowing you and in enjoying you. Lord, I pray you just minister to your people now as we open your word. Would you speak to us your words of life? We pray this in Jesus' name. The church said, amen. Say hi to somebody you don't know and introduce yourself. All right. Well, good morning. Great to worship with all of you. A few things I want to draw your attention to in the bulletin before we open up God's Word. Uh, the first thing is today is the last day to register your child for VBS. That's the first VBS, uh, July 22nd through the 26th. So just want to encourage you all to do that. You can uh, go to the lobby and you'll find these little flyers out there and um, you can do it the old-fashioned way. If you want to just register with paper, you can do that. Or on the back, there is a QR code. You can scan with your phone and fill out registration online. Um, so, yeah, I just want to encourage you all to, to do that and, and be praying for that outreach. Um, coming up this week, we've got... Um, Let's see, what's going on? Family camp is taking place, so there's going to be a lot of us going up. Yeah, excited about that. Uh, so please keep us in your prayers as uh, we're seeking God together um, up there in the mountains. Um, we have Friday morning men's Bible study, uh, youth group, high school. Also, oh, I skipped over young adults. Uh, they are going to be meeting July 11th as well. We have uh, the house building mission trip to Mexico. That's July 28th through August 3rd. We have raised all the money for that. Praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to build three houses. Um, so please be praying. Yeah, that's exciting. That's good stuff. Um, praise the Lord for that. So uh, please, though, be praying for all who are going to be attending. We got about 35 people from our church going, uh, building houses and ministering. And you know what? When you step out in faith, it's a wonderful thing, but it's also, we need to be aware that the enemy is on the attack too. Uh, when you're wanting to you know, serve God and minister, um, there's going to be an attack. So we, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices and his schemes. And so we need to pray as a church um, for this, this outreach. So I want to encourage you guys to, to do that. Um, coming up in uh, later this summer, August 1st, there's going to be God's Man's Boot Camp. Um, that is a discipleship program for men that Pastor Bud has been doing for several years now. And I'm just curious, who has gone through that program? Please raise your hand. Okay, we got a lot of men who have done it. And uh, so if you're a man and you're wanting to grow deeper in your relationship with God, uh, talk to one of those people who just raised their hand about the, I'll just call it GMBC. That's easier. Um, talk to them about the discipleship program and uh, they'll tell you it's worth it. It's worth the time. It's about an eight-week uh, course. And um, if you have questions, you can also email Pastor Bud at uh, pastorbud at cccchico.com. Uh, right now, Pastor Bud is on the East Coast. He's an FBI chaplain. He's ministering to those uh, FBI agents who are getting ready to be sent all over the country. He's met a couple people from Chico, which is kind of interesting uh, to be 3,000 miles from home and, and uh, meeting 
agents who are um, from Chico or going to Chico. Um, and so there's a real cool ministry there, but please pray for him. Keep him lifted up. He'll be there for, I think, another week or so. But I um, think that's about it for our announcements. Pastor Sam's going to share the word with us now. Thanks, Jacob. Good to see all of you. As always, looking forward to our time in God's Word. It's a day special because we'll be sharing in communion together at the end of the service. So, Lord, would you just pour your spirit out as we open your Word? Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? And may you find our hearts receptive for the life-transforming, life-changing word of truth. Bless us as only you can, Lord, through your word and by your spirit. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, turn with me in your Bible to 2 John, title of our study today, No Greater Need. As you're finding your way there, and if you have trouble with it, you're, you're, if you're in 1 John, it's going to follow right after. If you're uh, for too far, you're in Revelation, work your way backwards. But uh, anyway, you will find it. And uh, a couple things as it relates to John the Apostle. He was originally the youngest in the group. Now he calls himself the elder. So I think that means he's put some years on and I know that in fact to be the case. So um, it, it's interesting to me just having studied and read these things over and over the gospels over and over so many times that you see the competition between like Peter and John. And, and we've looked at it there at the end of John's gospel where, where they run together to the tomb, but John outruns Peter, and then he says he got there first, and then he says he must make five references to being faster, and of course he was younger, but now he's older, and, uh, but he's still, he's still, I think, and it's a personal opinion, I think he's still trying to compete with Peter because Peter in his writings calls himself an elder, John here says the elder. So take that, Peter. Anyway, the elder, chapter one, verse one. It's only one chapter, by the way. To the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. I like this because I've, as we've gone through, especially the shorter epistles, I've done my best to, to help you see that if you want to know what the theme is anywhere in scripture, but especially in these kinds of letters, just look for the words that repeat. And John is really good at this. And, and so the words truth, the word truth appears three times in this um, opening couple verses and uh and, and he has in truth and then he has the truth and then he has the truth and this is important to us today because I don't believe there's ever been a time in history where so many people who are otherwise smart you know some of them brilliant some of them professors doubting and actually saying that they don't believe there's such a thing as the truth. There's a truth, or there's your truth, and there's my truth, but that's not how the Bible frames truth. And, and we're going to see today, truth and love, these have to be together. And, uh, and so uh, love also has been defined in many ways that kind of surprised me. And I grew up in a very liberal uh, part of California. Grew up, I mean, I, that's a term that's used often and relatively. But, but I was, you know, 16 years old when I moved to Newport Beach. And it was a more, it was actually conservative politically, but, but pretty liberal morally and such. And then even further south, Laguna Beach, where where Pam and I had our first son. Well, she had him. I was just there. But, um, but uh, they were ex 
exceedingly liberal complaint compared to even Newport Beach. And then we were in Huntington Beach, and, and, uh, but a little bit inland when our second son was born. And then we realized, you know, we're not going to be able to live at the beach ever again. And so we started looking north, and, well, we ended up here. It's a long and short story, but short for today. Anyway, the, this theme of love and truth, it's, it permeates John's writings. And I'll share a few things later as we're walking together through all this related to that and, and then what some others have to say about it as well. Now, when John identifies himself as the elder, it's telling us a couple things. First of all, John lived longer than these other guys. And, and so he was the youngest and he lived the longest. And that's important, but at this point, that word elder notes his maturity, both physically and spiritually. He writes to the elect lady and her children, all right, uh, either an actual woman or Jesus church. And we don't have to try to figure out which one it is because it could certainly be both. It doesn't have to be one or the other, but, but if it's an actual woman, well, then, then uh, she's a gal with a family. And if it's the church, well, you know, the church is called the bride of Christ. So that kind of terminology does play out. Uh, if he's talking to the family or he's talking to the fellowship, well, we need to know it's, it's true either way because godly families are the foundation for a godly fellowship. And godly fellowships, the foundation for godly communities. And godly communities, well, it just goes like that. It begins at home, and then it spreads out and out and out. So the whole key here, if I understand it, and I'm pretty sure I do, is that, that we need to make sure we are a godly family. If you're a husband, you are the head of your household not smarter than your wife. Well, some of you might be, but most of you, I know a lot of guys and they're not all smarter than their wives, that's for sure. But the, the point is you have to be the head of the house because God's made you the head of the household. And the head is the one who's responsible. And I like it because, you know, Jesus is the living head of his church, which means he's responsible for us. And well, he directs all of us because each of us apart and we play a part. So in any case, um, godly families, again, the foundation. And, and so we start where he starts. Now, godly families don't just happen. A godly husband, a godly wife. If you're not yet married, here's a tip. Marry a godly person. And I've talked to a lot of young guys and they're like, well, she could be the one or she could be the one. And I'm like, don't worry about if she's the one. Worry about becoming the person she needs if she's the one. Because that's really all we can do. And if you become the man God wants you to be, you're going to find godly women attracted to you. And if you're attracted to somebody and they're not godly, or, or you don't even think, you might think, well, they're godly, but not as godly as me then don't marry him. Tell him that. Say, so you need to step up and grow up and become who God wants you to be. Well, anyway, all of that brings us to a couple things. And let me see. 2 Timothy 3.16 reminds us that, that the process of becoming who God wants us to be and all God's plan and purpose for us to become is in his word. All scripture, this is 2 Timothy 3.16, you could jot it down. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine tells us what's right, what's true. And in a generation where so many people question if there even is a right, if there even is a true, Bible doctrine says this is true true. Doctrine, reproof, that tells us what's wrong, what needs to change. And, and then correction tells us how to change, how to do it, how to implement it, how to get right. And then instruction and in righteousness, that tells us how to stay right, how to walk the walk and live the life that God's called us to. And, uh, and after saying those things in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and verse 17, he says that the man of God or the child of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
Now that's true for every child of God, that he wants to fit us for the work of ministry. He's already called us. If you're in Christ and he's in you, you've already responded. He sealed you with his Holy Spirit. It is the proof of ownership because he bought you, right? You were bought with a very expensive price. That was Jesus' bloodshed and life given for you. So, so all that brings us to this reality that, that as children of God, as men and women of God, as those who have the scripture, the word of God, well, we need to let people know who live around us or go to work with us or go to school with us, whoever it might be, whoever they might be, when somebody says, I don't believe there's such a thing as absolute truth. And you should just say, well, you're absolutely wrong. And, uh, and because, because anybody can say anything about anything. But, but we don't need to just tell people what we think about it. If they're like, oh, really? What do you think about it? You can say, I really don't think about it. I just know there is truth because the Bible says there is truth. And if we don't have that, then everything else is going to fall apart. And that's what's happening in our society today. To deny the truth is going to put a real dent in our ability to love as God's instructed us, that the man of God would be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that, that will includes loving in truth. And the word love's going to appear a couple times here, um, four times actually in this book. And, and truth is going to show up five times. And, and, and so you can't really explain or or define or experience one apart from the other. If you separate truth and love, you're going to be confused about the truth and you're going to be failing to love as God intends. Because you separate these two or redefine them as our society is, well, that it's going to lead to confusion. It's going to lead to disaster. And I believe to deny that there is truth makes the kind of love he's shown us impossible. God's love is unconditional and sacrificial. And that's the truth. It's not naive or gullible though. And that's the truth. And again, today, love's been redefined. Marriage is redefined. Family's redefined. Everything's redefined. I don't know what a dictionary would look like today if you got a, you know, a paper one. I have one of the largest old school dictionaries. How do you know it's old school? Because lots of the definitions in it relate to and, and reference the Bible as the source. You're not going to get that in a modern dictionary on a modern campus today. So um, God's love, well, he demonstrated it. And, and well... He demonstrated it in the most practical way he possibly could. We were dead in trespasses and sins, so he died for those sins so we could be alive forever in him. So truth biblically is unchanging and certain. And we know that if you separate the two, you're going to have some problems. I'll give you an illustration of that in a moment. But I wanted to say, when people are today saying, well, I, I don't just believe there are only two sexes. I know that to be a fact. And if people are like, oh, you can't know that. Well, you really can because God made Adam personally hands-on. And then he made Eve from Adam and for Adam personally heads hands on. And then, and then he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Years ago, the Lord gave me a little illustration related to this. And uh, for some reason in first service, it reminded me of Gilligan's Island. And, and it's like, for those of you who've seen, you know, and, and it's like, even if you're younger, I'm sure you saw it on something. Uh, but, but, you know, 
When I was in Israel with my pastor, Pastor Chuck, the only time he ever took me to Israel, took me a lot of places, he had me come to lead worship because that's what he knew me as. So I'd always be like, am I going to get to teach? He's like, maybe once. And, uh, but, but I led worship everywhere we were. And when we were on the Sea of Galilee with this huge group of boats all tied together and there's speakers on all of them, I decided to do that theme um, of to, well, sing Amazing Grace to the theme of, of um, Gilligan's Island. And so you, you can picture it. You could easily do it. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. It saves a wretch like me. Once was lost, but now I'm found. Was found, and now I see for a three-hour tour. Um, well, anyway, everybody on the that I could hear all around me because I was sort of in the middle of this whole thing and all these boats together and we're on the Sea of Galilee and everybody's singing it. And my pastor's looking at me and he kind of does it. When people fold their arms in front of you, that always makes you nervous. And, and so I don't want to make you nervous, so I'll stop. But, but anyway, I, I, he looks at me and, and he kind of has a quizzical look on his face, which I'd seen before because we traveled before. And, and, he, and at the end, he's like, what was that? Because he realized everybody was singing it but him. And I go, that's Gilligan's Island, Chuck. And, and he goes, I never watched Gilligan's Island. Hey, he never watched most things because he grew up in a very strict family that, that you know, we're pre-trib rapture, as he certainly was. We believe the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. He was taught that if he was in a theater and the rapture happened, he'd be left behind. And here's a real irony. Later, they had the movie Left Behind in the theaters. But, but nonetheless, my, my whole point in sharing this is I think about the island and I immediately end up on Gilligan's Island, but I've been on a lot of different islands over the years. And, and here's what guys show me. You take a hundred guys and you put them on a, a you know, island way out there where no one's ever going to reach them. And, uh, and, and you leave them there. You come back in a hundred years. What do you have? Bones. You put a hundred gals on the same island, but not with the guys. And you leave and come back. And, well, somebody comes back in a hundred years. <laughs> not a lot of hundred year olds want to go visit the island where... But anyway, the whole point is you come back, there's just bones. Why? Because it takes a male and a female to produce a child. Why does it require that? Because that was God's plan. That was what he had in mind. And we see it in Adam and Eve, first couple. And they were not only the first couple to walk with God, they were the first couple to sin against God. And the fruit of their relationship as sinners was, well, Cain and Abel, first son was Cain, he's a murderer. Abel, murdered by his brother. So as soon as they sin and sin enters in, everything from that point on is corrupted. And what this is all about, our getting into the word and the word getting into us, is bringing us back to the sure foundation of God's truth, of God's word, which are absolute and unchanging. Well, you maybe heard it, love without truth, well, is merely sentimental or can be. Truth without love can be brutal. And we see it in the, the woman that they brought to Jesus. He's there in the temple courts. He's teaching. All the people are tuned in and excited to hear him. And in the midst of it, the religious leaders who had already rejected him and were trying to set him up, to, to lay a trap for them. They bring this woman and throw her down into the midst. And they said, we found this woman and caught her in the very act of adultery. That had to be a weird scene. But nonetheless, they say, Moses says in the law that she should be stoned. What say ye? And, and their, their goal here is simple. They're, they don't care about the woman and they don't care about her sin. They just use her as a pawn in order to set Jesus up because if he says don't stone her, well, the law says stone her, then he's not, not a, a law keeper. He's a law breaker, something he never did. He never ever broke one of God's laws. How do we know? Because he was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. And sin is what we call breaking the law. The law just calls it the law. It's a thing or whatever it is. But, but, but so... 
again, they're thinking if he says stoner, the people will know that he's not the merciful, kind, and wonderful man they're all saying he is. But if he says don't, if, oh, don't stoner, then, then that's, you know, going against Moses. If he says stoner, well, then that's the other side, as I just shared. So, so that's what they see. That's, that's all that they could envision. So Jesus just is silent before him. He just is quiet. And, and, and they're pressing him and saying, come on, what's the, you know. The, and, and then eventually he, he kneels down and he starts writing in the dust. And he says, um, you know, let you who's without sin cast the first stone. And it probably got real quiet. And then, you know, they're looking at each other and they're trying to figure it out. And then it says, from the eldest to the youngest, they all left. One after another, after another, after another, till all were gone. And it was just Jesus and this woman. And, and listen, I, I have a theory about why the older guys left first. Um, you know, most likely they just, having lived longer, had sinned more. And to say it's sinless, no, there's no one sinless but Jesus. So they all needed to go. But they started with the oldest. They got to the youngest, but they're all gone. He says to her, woman, where are your accusers? Have none condemned you? And she looks at him and says, no one, Lord. And then he says, and, and listen, it's, it's so important to get the whole picture whenever you're studying any portion of scripture. It's why I never teach a verse or I rarely teach just the verse. But, but even in the verse, there's going to be some context and there's going to be some background. But a chapter, I try to stick with about that as much as I can for this very simple reason. It gives you the context and you can fill in the blanks as I'm already doing. And then when there's application, well, each, each chapter is going to lead you into something else. Now, this book's only one chapter. The next book's only one chapter. Um, and so the, the bottom line, though, is we're getting a foundation from this book that John left for us. And that story applies directly to the idea that you have to have love and truth. The truth was she could be, and according to Moses, should be stoned. Love said, that's not going to happen. And the only one who could have stoned her was Jesus. And he didn't come to condemn. He didn't come to stone. He didn't come that people would die. He came that they could be forgiven and live. So he says two things to her. And if you camp on one or the other, there's a problem. And, and, but if you get both, then it works out perfectly. And, and the, the first one is, neither do I condemn you. I've heard whole sermons on that. God doesn't condemn anybody because God loves everybody and everybody's going to eventually be with him in heaven and sing Kumbaya and all that stuff. But the reality is though he loves everybody and though it's not his will any perish, but that all come to repentance, unless people come to repentance, they will. You will if you're here and you've never given your life to him and you continue to refuse to. You'll spend your life away from him. And away from him, that's about darkness and death and depravity and despair and hopelessness. But life in his presence, that's what John's been all about, all through 1 John and now 2 John, and we'll see it in 3 John. It's all about light and life and hope and truth and joy and peace and fellowship and it's everything good is in him and in his presence. Everything bad is the result of being separated from him. So he says, neither do I condemn you. That's half the story. The other is go and sin no more. I can give you one word for those, and that's repent. And, and listen, he's saying that same thing to every person here. To those of us who've walked with him for decades, for those of you who just started walking with him, for those of you who are not yet walking with him, you still need to give your life to him. But if you come here, it doesn't matter who stands up here and teaches the word. The gospel is always shared that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. When we get to communion today, and we're going to get to share that, 
He says, when you, well, well, the New Testament says that when you take this bread and you take this cup, you proclaim, you herald, you preach the Lord's death until he comes. That means you believe in his death, his resurrection, and his return, because there's no coming unless there was a resurrection. And so you're preaching, and you're like, I've never preached in my life. Well, you get to do that today when we share in communion. And I hope it becomes a habit, not just communion, but sharing Jesus with people because he is their only hope just as he was, is, and will always be your only hope. So, so first he confirms that she's forgiven and then he tells her to repent. He, he didn't say, well, I know you didn't do it. I know it was a setup. He didn't say, well, everybody does it. So what are you going to do about it? Or, or I have no problem with it. He didn't say any of the things that people would say who don't know him and read the story. Because he didn't come to condemn. Why? Because we were already condemned. He came to save us because without his forgiveness, without the, the, the blood he shed and the death he died, the life he gave, we would have been forever separated from him because we were dead in trespasses and sin. Well, all the way down to the second part of verse one, it says... <laughs> Uh, whom I love in the truth. So, so, so he said, writes to the elder, the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth. And, uh, and then he's going to build on this whole thing of love and truth and truth and love. And, and so, but you have them for the first time together there. And not only those who've known the truth, verse two, we read it. I'll read it to you again. Because of the truth, which abides in us and will be with us forever. When Jesus prayed for his disciples, and he did it many times, but in one of those prayers, he was praying to the Father as he always did. And he said, Father, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. And I've shared with you, and most of you know well, sanctify means to set apart. He certainly did that with them, and he's done it with us. And to cleanse, he's done that as well. And, and that's what he was praying. He's saying, sanctify them by your word. And then your word is truth. It's the truth that Jesus said abides with us forever. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, I mentioned already, sealed with the Holy Spirit. First convicted by him, then, then sealed when we open our heart to him, and then comforted because he tells us what only God can have for us. So love and truth, they are the currency of the kingdom. Without them and without them combined, you get a whole mess Greater love has no one, Jesus says, than to lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends, he says, if you do whatever I command you. Well, grace, mercy, and peace, we've seen these in other letters, but um, not, and mostly in this order, but grace, mercy, and peace will be with you, we read in verse three, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth, and love. See, I, what happens is I underline truth and I bolded love because I want to, every time I look at this, just like I do in my Bible, I mark it up so when I look at it, I can't miss those things that are, that are repeating and so essential. Now, I have Bibles that I haven't marked up because I like to also read the Bible and not get tripped up by the things I've already observed because God might want to make something else stand out to me, and he often does that. Well, anyway, grace, mercy, and peace. Grace, 148 times in Scripture. The first time is when Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The last time, this should make some sense, early in Genesis, Noah finds grace. Revelation 22, 21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That is the last verse 
and revelation. So it begins with grace and it ends with grace. And he's saying grace, well, you, you should know this already, but in case you're newer, mercy is not getting what you deserve. When God shows us mercy, he forgives us instead of giving us exactly what we've earned, exactly what we have coming because sin always has consequences. So mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve because nobody ever earned salvation. Nobody can earn salvation. That's why it had to be and has to be the gift of God, not of works less than he boasts, but we were told are his workmanship. He worked for us, he works in us, then he works through us. He makes us the people we were created to be in the first place. He makes us people that are going to someday stand before him perfected. You know, the last time that happened or the first time that happened was pre-sin in the Garden of Eden. Now, there are people in heaven today because we know that those who've gone before us who are in Christ, well, they're with the Lord and they're perfected. How do we know? Because absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So, so that's already a reality. And so they've experienced God's love. They've experienced his grace, his mercy. They've experienced his peace because you can never know the peace of God until you know the grace of God. You'll never be at peace with God until you understand that you don't earn it, you don't deserve it, and you can't even repay it. But he does have things for you to do, ways you can represent him, a people group. Some of us have a very small circle of people in our lives. Others have many people that, that we get to influence. But the key isn't how many people do you get to influence is what kind of influence are you in their lives? Because you, if you've read through it, you know that when Sodom and Gomorrah was about to be destroyed and God sent a message for Lot, got to get, get out of Dodge. This place is almost gone and it's going. And, and the angels who came down to speak with them gave them the word, hey, get those whom you have, those over whom you have influence is the gist of it, those who will listen to you. And because we're going through the Old Testament on Wednesday nights, we saw recently that Rahab saved her whole family because she believed and asked for salvation, not just for herself, but for all of her family. Lot had a family too, and he gets out of there with his wife and two daughters, but his wife doesn't even make it all the way to the mountain. She dies in that valley and, and it's its own story. But all of this to say when he went and told those people over whom he had some influence that destruction was coming, that the, the wrath of God was about to be poured out, they laughed at him. They thought that he was joking. So it's serious business to share the truth with a generation that denies there even is absolute truth but it's the business we're in. And when I say we're, I don't mean me and the other pastors or the pastor's wives. I mean all of us. Because again, Rahab only saved her family, but she saved her family. And Lot got some of the family out, but they didn't all make it to the mountain. And you have people in your life who you know who will listen to you because they've observed that you're different from all the other people they know. And you just need to be honest about what the difference is. Hey, I wouldn't, I'd be just like everyone else, but God's done this in my life and he's doing this through my life. Well, every time, by the way, these three appear together, they're from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and John adds in truth and love as again, these working together make all he intends possible. Um, verse four, I rejoiced greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we have received commandment from the father. This is important because after saying go and sin no more, Jesus began to speak to those who were still hanging out. 
Now, now a lot of people had left, but that's the, it doesn't mean everybody left. It means those who came with the intention of having this woman stoned, they're gone. But before they came and before Jesus was interrupted, he was teaching. So there's still people around. They heard this whole thing. They observed it. And, and, and so, so now he, he speaks. And as he speaks to them, this is what he has to say. I am the light of the world. It's John 8, 12, by the way. I am the light of the world. He who follows after me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John has majored, especially in 1 John, on walking in love, walking in light, and walking in truth, because that's walking in life. Life in Jesus is all about love and light and truth. And this generation needs to hear it. Verse five, now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but which you have had, one which you have had from the beginning, that we love one another. That phrase 13 times in scripture, and all God commands, you know this to be true, he empowers. When he tells the man with the withered hand to hold out his hand, with the command came the power to do the impossible. He commands the impossible, then he makes the impossible not just probable, but possible. And the wonder of it is he does that with us constantly and we just don't always recognize it. If in fact you feel God leading you or calling you to do something so out of your comfort zone, you're like, that can't be you, Lord. Let me disagree. I believe that's absolutely him because God wants us to experience him in the fullest. And, and when I sense his pleasure the most, it isn't when I'm most comfortable or kicking back or relaxing. It's when I'm in a situation that I would have done anything to avoid. Didn't want to be there. Didn't want to be his mouthpiece and didn't want to talk in this arena. Now listen, that's never true here. I, I so love opening the Bible with people that love God and love his word. But I talk to people all the time that neither of those things are true. And, and that's why I'm saying to you, I have a circle, but my circle isn't any bigger than yours. If we're talking about the unbelievers in my life, you probably have a much bigger circle, especially if you've come to the Lord more recently. Longer we walk with the Lord, the less people are comfortable around us who aren't. But your goal and your plan is to pull them in, not to push them away, not to judge them, not to condemn them, because Jesus doesn't do any of that, but to pull them in and say, listen, you need to hear it. You need to hear it. And, and so um, let's see, where does that lead me and what else do I want to share before I press on? Um, we learned again in 1 John, God demonstrates his love by going to the cross. And this is love, not that we loved him, but he loved us and gave himself for us. We demonstrate our love by obedience to him. How do I know? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And, and that's exactly what he says in verse six. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. It's the commandment that, as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Now he tells us why this is oh so important in verse seven. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now he's gonna use the phrase, they went out from us, and uh, that means they were once hanging out. They were once singing the songs and listening to the Bible study. They were once hanging around. But just as Judas was with them, but not really one of them, everyone would have said, hey, who are the 12? He would have been named with the others. But Jesus said he was never a child of God. He was the son of perdition and not one other disciple ever put that together until the very end, until it was far too late. Well, there are deceivers 
and there are antichrist, and he says they used to be, but now they're gone. And so Acts 15, 24, um, since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, that th th this was he him addressing, I know that it was a direct attack. Like they were saved by grace through faith, that not of themselves, that the gift of God, not of works, lest any boast. They all heard that and they all believed it. Then these guys come and say, well, listen, that's great. You're a Christian. We love Jesus too, but you need to be circumcised and you need to keep the law of Moses. And, and listen, the, the, the circumcision was for the Jews. It set them apart. It was a seal of God's covenant with them. And the law of Moses, that was his gift to Israel, the nation of Israel. And they were the only people on the planet that had it. But now we have it. And, and all that to say, say this is, is simple. These guys fellowshiped together, but some of them were just pretending to be what the others actually were. So uh, 1 John 2, 19, we saw this just a few weeks back in 1 John. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. In 1 John, they denied his humanity and um, that he came in the flesh. They denied his miraculous birth, his sinless life, his vicarious death, his bodily resurrection, his ascension to heaven. And hear this statement that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. It's speaking to his second coming. And he's coming for us in the clouds. He's coming to rule and reign in a righteousness. Peace and prosperity will cover the earth, but not till he takes us to him and brings us back to rule and reign with him. The deceivers were imposters. They weren't just confused as I'll say some people are just confused. They're not claiming though to be believers. Most of them I talk to, they're like, well, I, I, I know a little bit about the man upstairs. I go, oh, you have a landlord? Because the man upstairs, that's not, a, I never see anyone in the Bible referring to our creator, sustainer, savior, miraculous provider, and, and loving God as the man upstairs. If you're talking to someone and there's that vocabulary, you need to say, you might not actually know the God we're talking about. But anyway, he's coming for us, and he's coming to rule and reign. So these deceivers... They heard and rejected the truth, and they were preaching, but they were preaching a lie. Antichrist, fifth and final time, uh, it's used as against Jesus, claim to be Jesus, or, or another Christ, or if they have another gospel, they're all Antichrist. And now, not the Antichrist of Revelation will be there in a few months. I would say a few weeks, but I know better. Um, but deceivers and antichrist, anyone who is against Christ is an antichrist. You get that, you know? It's like anti-meat. You know, if you're against meat, you're an anti-meat. An anti-meater. There's, I guess that's a really bad illustration. But, um, but anyway, if you're against tofu, welcome to my world. Um, but anyway, like he, he, the last time, and this is so important, it's the, the last time it is, is the last test. It has to do with what they say about Jesus. And I want to say, and I use this illustration, it might have even been last week, but I don't know if it was on the weekend or if it was in the midweek, and I can't bear to go and listen to me for an hour to find out what I said. And so, um, but I did use the example of sincerity and, and that to me that, that a suicide bomber is absolutely sincere. They truly believe that them giving their lives and murdering all these other innocents, what they call them infidels, but murdering these innocents, that they're going to get a glorious place, a better life after this. No murderer, we read, has a everlasting life or eternal life in him. And a murderer can be forgiven, but listen, not 
a suicide bomber. Why? Because they're blown to bits. And, and, and so don't confuse sincerity with reality. There are some very nice people, very sincere people. Who they really believe what they believe, but it doesn't make them right. And this isn't about sincerity. It's about truth and love. First, um, uh, 2 Corinthians 11.3, and then we're going to read the last few verses of this. Don't, don't fret. We're almost there, believe it or not. It says, I, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I like that. It's not complicated to say Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Anyone can understand that. But the simplicity in Christ, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you've not received, or a different gospel, which you've not accepted, you may well put up with it. Listen, all three are preached today. Another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. But the word says, he who has the son has life. He who is not the son of God does not have life. Look to yourself, verse 8, that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Listen, in Jesus' letter to the Philadelphian church, he promises an open door. And he praises them. He says, you've got a little strength, but you've kept my word and not denied my name. And when we get to Revelation and we look at the seven letters to the seven churches, this is the one you want to identify with. Not great strength, just a little strength. And, uh, but, but keepers of his word and not deniers of his name. Verse 9 says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. I shared in the introduction, doctrine means truth. Whoever doesn't have the truth about Jesus, well, he... he He's, he's lost. He doesn't have the Father and the Son because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. If anyone comes to you, verse 10, and does not bring this doctrine, this truth, do not receive him into your house or greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. It's not saying you can't talk to a neighbor over the fence or you can't talk to someone out by the mailbox or wherever it happens to be. It's talking about entertaining people, bringing them into your home and giving them access to the people in your life so they can spread their lie. He's saying, don't ever engage in that. Don't ever do that. But he's not saying don't reach out to the people around you because if we do this and just say, well, me and you and, well, maybe a few, that's never been God's plan. He died for the whole world. He wants the whole world and the world's in darkness and we are the light of this world. When it came to prophesying, it was important. It's important for you to know under the old covenant, the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, a prophet had to be 100% accurate 100% of the time. And the failure to be so was punishable by death. And that death was by stoning. So it was a big deal to prophesy in that day. And yet Jesus says, many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many will come saying, I am the Christ. But there can only be one not Jesus Christ for his day or for this day or that day, but for all time. One Savior, our Lord, our Savior Jesus. If anyone comes to you, well, he's saying, don't, don't give them a platform. I have stories about them, but I'll, I'll save them for another time because we want to share in communion and we have two more verses. John says, having many things to write to you, I do not wish to do so with paper and ink. 
That's pretty much how they wrote. But he's saying, I have a better plan. But I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. We saw it in 1 John. In your presence is fullness of joy. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. Lord, I thank you so much for John, for, for the years he got to spend with you, the life he lived for you, that he was the youngest and now he's the eldest, Lord. He was survived longer than all the rest because you still had work for him to do in his latter years. And I'm so grateful for all the younger people here today, but I'm also grateful Grateful for the older people, those who seasoned saints who've walked with you for decades and know things that they've learned through while well, walking with you for all those years. My prayer, our prayer, Lord, is that you'd pour your spirit out on everyone from the youngest to the eldest, both, both naturally and spiritually. And Lord, that you would speak to each of us, that you would confirm the things that you have for us individually and as families and as a fellowship. And then Lord, you would work through us, that you would give us something to do that leads us to say, Lord, that's impossible for me. And that you'll show them you're the same God who who worked the impossible throughout all of history. You're the same. And Lord, I pray right now for all my brothers and sisters that there would be open hearts and, and passion to be all that you've planned and purposed them to become and to do all that you've planned and purposed for them to do, that not one would fail to catch all this today and put something in it into practice. And if you're here and you've never said, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, forgive my every sin, you need to do that today. And why today? Because you're here and you're hearing it and the offer's on the table. Jesus, listen, Jesus died for your sin. According to the scripture, it was prophesied. He, he was buried and he rose again the third day. That was prophesied. And he is coming soon for his own. And we'll be with him. And then his wrath will be poured out on this Christ-hating, Christ-mocking, Christ-rejecting world. But listen, you don't want to be here for that. And, and so if you haven't given your life to the Lord Jesus, I'd ask you to do two things. First, raise your hand, hold it high, and then look up and catch my eye. Why? Because I want you to leave here fully assured that you're sins are forgiven, that they're washed clean, that they're no longer an issue. And when Jesus looks at you, he doesn't see a sinner. He sees a sinner saved by grace. He doesn't just see a guilty sinner. He sees a son or a daughter in the faith. Anyone this hour, anyone this service, You who are in the overflow, the cafe, logged on, listening in. Listen, this, this is what it comes to. John the Baptist called everyone who came to him to repentance. God's calling us to repentance. If you're a believer and there's things in your life that shouldn't be, repent today. And, and celebrate communion to celebrate that repentance and if repent is a foreign word to you, it means to, to say what God says about it, to turn from it, to stop doing it. You're going the wrong way. Turn around and walk not away from him, but right to him. So, Lord, I pray for all my brothers and sisters. We pray together. We unite in prayer for any who have yet to give their life to you. And we pray that that would happen, Lord, that not one here would perish. Not one hearing would perish, but all would come to repentance. In your precious name, amen. Hey, you can uh, stay seated. The ushers are going to bring the bread and the cup. We're going to worship. And after we've all been served, we'll pause. We'll speak for a moment, and then we'll eat together, and then we'll um, have one last song together. Thanks, Mark.
cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree body bound and drenched in tears that laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance here by heavy stone Messiah still and all night the cross just ahead you took bread and you blessed it and you broke it and you distributed it to the your disciples and you said take and eat this is my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me the cup you call it the cup of the new covenant in your blood. And we know throughout the scripture, every covenant established in blood. But we read and learned in Hebrews, all the blood of bulls and goats ever shed, never washed away one sin, but testified daily for the need and for the plan for forgiveness. You didn't just suffer you weren't just mocked and bruised and battered and wounded. You weren't just crucified. You went through all that for us. And Lord, we get it. That's how bad sin is in your sight. That that's what we had coming. And it would have been just and right. But Lord, you died the just one for the unjust, the sinless for the sinner, the Savior for the lost. And now we celebrate you. We remember you. And we know a day will come where we will stand before you in glory. And we will be perfected in your presence. But between here and there, we know you've left us on purpose and with purpose. That we would be the light of the world. That we would be the salt of the earth. That we would be living witnesses of your life transforming power. So Lord, we take the bread and we take the cup and we ask for your forgiveness. We repent of those things that keep us from experiencing you in the fullest and keep us from shining the brightest for you. And we pray for those still in the valley of decision that, that you'll bring them all the way, Lord, to faith in you, to everlasting life in you. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. Let's eat and drink together, you guys. Are you ready? Would you stand with us, please? Then on the third
Please come on down.